Hi, um, I'm Peter Lane. I'm one of the product managers here. I think I've met many of you in the past. Um, so as Ozer mentioned, we are talking about the AP270. Um, so this is our first, or our first outdoor 11AC access point. Um, you guys can hand it around. This is going to be actually the shipping unit, what it looks oh. like and how it ships. Yeah. It's a little top heavy. Yeah. I'll explain that in just a second. So um, this is what it looks like. On the back, you have uh, two Ethernet ports and an AC port. Um, behind this is a USB console or a reset button. We really don't expect people to be using the console much in the field, so it's not meant to be left open. Um, the unit is a very aggressive price. Right now we're looking at a list price of $19.95. Um, so we expect people to swap out the unit and then do the kind of debugging back on the bench. Um, you may notice it's a relatively small unit. So the bottom half down here is actually just the antennas. So the AP itself is in the top portion. Uh, the plastic you see around the outside is the sun shield, which comes pre-mounted and shipped. Then on the top, this little kind of eyepiece is actually the mount for it. So we've designed a bracket that looks like this. So the bracket's designed to fit on a wall or a pole, and then you just slide the AP onto the front of it, and that's pretty much all it takes to mount. So that has built-in omnidirectional integrated antennas, um, for it, we'll talk more about what those look like in just a minute. So you end up with a very small volume, small form factor device that's designed to, so I knew you guys would do this, the <laughs> bracket doesn't quite fit. So that was a milled prototype. Um, the shipping units are a little different. If you look, you get about halfway yeah. because it gets wider. It's tapered so you can only mount it the right direction. Um, the original bracket we built was flat. You could mount in either direction. We realized that was a problem. So we've done a lot to simplify the installation. Um, we got a lot of feedback off of the AP175 and the previous products that they're too complicated. Right? Trying to mount and install outdoor APs is hard. You have to understand weatherizing. You have to understand the antennas, put them in the right place, mount the whole thing together. And training someone to do all of that on top of a bucket truck in the cold is very, very difficult. It takes uh, 8023AT power or AC power. So you can use PUE plus or standard AC power out of a light pole. Um, so we were thinking a lot about the usability and the deployability of it. One of the other bits of feedback we got from the 175, uh, which I guess we don't have one in here right now, it was too large and it didn't really pass the aesthetics committees. I didn't know these things existed, but apparently universities and a lot of other stuff in the outdoor world, the aesthetics is incredibly important. So when we designed it, we designed it to look kind of like the other things that are hanging out on light poles right now. Looks a little bit like a light, looks a little bit like a security camera. It's actually about the same size as most of the IP security cameras that are out there. Um, so that's some of the stuff we were thinking about it. It's pretty much the smallest total volume. It's the first 11AC outdoor access point from anybody. Um, it will be controller-based or controllerless, so it's going to support instant as well as the controller-based software. Um, and it should be much, much easier to install and much easier to get past uh, any committees that are looking at the aesthetics of yeah, the device. I a quick question about it on the front there. There's like a little camera looking eye. That is an LED. Okay. So it's a status LED? It's a status LED, kind of. When you first turn it on, it'll be on for about the first 30 or 60 seconds. Then it turns off. We didn't want to have blinking lights out there all the time. It only turns on after that in an error condition. So it'll turn on, you'll see it turn green, it'll stay that way for a minute or two, and then it'll just turn off. Then if something goes wrong, you'll see it flash red. Okay. Thank you. And is that two five gigahertz radios, or is it just, did you leave off where it says two, so, so it's not two? It's pretty much the exact same internals as an AP275. I say pretty much because we use the industrialized parts rather than the standard CPU and memory. But you have the same radios in there as the AP225. So you have a three stream 11N 2.4 gigahertz radio and then a three stream 11N, 11AC 5 gigahertz radio. I corrected myself, give me a second. <laughs> um, so it does support 11AC beamforming just like the 225. It's gonna be literally the exact same code on the system. From a temperature point of view, it supports minus 40 degrees Celsius to 65 degrees Celsius. For those of you who can't do the conversions, that's up to about 150 degrees Fahrenheit without any problems. 
Um, we are using industrialized parts, so this is the first one that really doesn't have a heater in it. Most of the competing products in the AP175 have a heater, which sounds great until you realize you plug that in and it's minus 20 out, it takes 15, 20 minutes for the heater to heat up the AP before it can boot. Now you plug it in, it boots right away because the CPU and the memory in there can actually run at those temperatures. So the, the, you can fire it up at NEG40 and you won't have like thermal cracking of the motherboard and things like that we see in other components? Nope. Cool. It's all been tested, working, and verified. It does consume about 23 watts of power, so it is PoE plus only. Um, you cannot run it on standard PoE, it's because the power amplifiers and everything else in there just didn't work and it didn't make sense to try and get it down in that budget because it would kill a lot of the performance. How does the, the with the, there's a bit of a lack of multipath outdoors, so how, do you, what, how many streams do you really see? I mean, okay, you might be a lot of smartphones at a single stream, but if you were, if you were using a three stream laptop, there wasn't much around, are you likely to even get two streams? So you jumped forward a bunch on me. <laughs> um, well, so we'll start with the antenna stuff. Chuck really wants to be presenting this. Yeah, we will pull it up. Um, so you're right. Outdoor, outdoor, we don't run into too much multipath. But one of the things we have done, this is the antenna system within the AP. So this is what's kind of in that bucket on the bottom. Um, it's kind of hard to see in this graph, but you have three 5 gigahertz radios, three, two, four. The important thing, though, is on the 5 gig, these smaller ones, we have two H and one V antenna. So by changing the polarization of the antennas, we can actually routinely get two stream performance, even when it's line of sight with no multipath. Right. So that's kind of like what PAP point to point MIMO systems do. Right, it's what we've been recommending in like the 175 for a while, and we've built it in. You're right, we don't see too many three streams unless you get some multipath, but we still get some very good performance out at range mm. for what's going on. Um, so that's been working very well for us. I'm gonna hop back a whole bunch of slides. Do you go back to your last bullet list? I just had a question, you said it had cellular integration or something? <laughs> so advanced what we have is break. actually advanced cellular coexistence. Um, so give me two seconds to get there, I want to cover a few other things. Um, it is IP66, IP67 rated um, for both of those, but the advanced cellular coexistence feature, what that really is, is a fancy word for really good out-of-band filtering. Um, we're seeing a lot of LTE show up in kind of the 2.3 and the 2.6 gigahertz range. Um, which can actually impact 2.4, the side lobes when you get close. So we put in very, very strong filtering. That's what you're looking at down here. Um, this is a signal graph from uh, 10 dB all the way down to about minus 60. Um, and so at, at 2.4, the filtering falls off, the signal comes back up, and then when you hit about uh, the end of 2.4, almost 2.5, it comes back. So we have a very good filtering to make sure that doesn't happen. So if you're deploying this outdoors, you can put it within a couple meters of a cellular base station and not have a problem. We have similar filtering on the 225 indoors. Um, and we can put a 225 next to a, a DAS system about a foot and a half um, and not see any impact at all. Um, we've been finding that people are putting these things closer and closer together and there's more and more DAS out there and it can significantly impact it if you don't have this kind of shielding. This is not specifically related to your outdoor AP but then I, and I guess with the newer the AC indoor AC access point you, do, you obviously get uh, four, three, 3G 4G repeaters indoors as well so what sort of distance uh, you, I'm sure there probably might be some well there's obviously some filtering but what sort of distance should you maintain? About a between? foot and a half. Okay, so even with the, the indoor AP, if you've got a... If you've got a repeater. DAS antenna here, a foot and a half away, I can put an AP-225 and have no problem. Right. Okay. Um, because of this filtering. If you go back to like an AP-105 or some of the older APs that didn't have that, we'd say more in the range of 15, 20 feet. Okay, so this is not specific to the outdoor AP, it's also in the... It's in the AP-225, the AP-115, and the outdoor It'll probably continue to be that way because of the increasing prevalence, as you say. Exactly, and we're gonna be putting in all of our new APs. Right. Um, so pretty much all the current generation, the ones with the nice shiny white covers, have the advanced cellular coexistence. I'm sorry, if I missed it, what's under the covers? So you can actually unscrew that if you'd like. Um, you've got two ethernet ports there, eth0 okay. and eth1. Um, and the way they actually connect is pretty simple. We have a little gland. It's a, a standard gland, somewhere from like AP85. You shove the cable through, yep. you crimp it, and then you tighten that down, and it solidifies and gives you an IP67 or IP66 rated connection. Um, you're using AC, is there PoE out at all? There is not PoE out of the AP. 
Um, we did have that on the 175, and we kind of looked at the numbers of who adopted it, and it was incredibly small numbers. Right. So and so adding that PUE out had a significant cost factor on the AP. Um, as I mentioned, the AP has a, the antenna version, the internal antenna version has a list price of 1995. Um, the external antenna version has a list price of 1595. So was it just video cameras? Is that pretty much the only use case? That's pretty that much the main the use case we've seen. Um, and you can actually get AC to PUE injectors that'll do it into two. Um, so if you want, you can put a PUE injector to do both the camera and the AP. Right. Um, so you only really need one box to handle that. And so from that use case, we just didn't see enough desire for it. Right. But you can still plug that video camera into the Ethernet port and push data through it so that you can have kind of the backhaul going if you'd like. Uh, something else we, we found working in the outdoor video space is... Do you have the mic? Oh, sorry. Um. Uh, so, something else we've seen in the outdoor video space also is it's, uh, you know, the cameras themselves are advancing rapidly in terms of their requirements. And so it's not uncommon now to have 60-watt cameras, right, some of the new access cameras and so on. Um, and we can never quite um, have the, uh, you never know quite how many cameras you need at a particular location. Some locations just one, some three, four. In Beijing, it can be 10. <laughs> so um, our, our, our conclusion was um, uh, we, we, we felt that it was most important to have a really affordable, uh, really uh, uh, high capability access point. And then if you, if you need a lot of that type of connection at a particular location, you can do that with a separate device. Right. right, and then feed it from the second port. And so a lot of our focus on this AP was ease of use, ease of installation, lowering total cost of ownership. Um, another example, this is the AP, how it ships in box. When you open it up, the ports are actually pointing out of the box at you. So if you're pre-staging this outdoor system, you don't even take the AP out of the box. You tear a little bit of plastic, plug in the connector, and you configure it. Um, just trying to make it as easy as possible to set up, manage, and maintain these outdoor networks, which have historically been very, very hard. So from an ordering point of view, it's incredibly simple. You order the AP, the bracket, you're done. Um, this is opposed to a lot of the competing solutions and the older solutions where it's give me the AP, give me these lightning arresters, I need these particular antennas, give me, this pat, give me these coax cables to connect it. All that sort of stuff is no longer here. Um, it's just very, very Is there very any, um, any provision for any articulating whatsoever? That's a good question. There is. So real quickly to mount it, you literally just slide it in and attach a screw. Um, this is, I believe, an 18-inch mount. We do have some smaller mounts that are shorter. Um, I don't think I have pictures of them in here. Uh, we have a, an 8-inch mount as well for the side of a building. Um, the reason we have the two mounts is the larger mount gives us less shadow from the light pole that we're connected to. So that's what you're looking at here. It's a bit hard to read, um, but this is if you put the AP 2, 8, 12, 18 inches away from the light pole, what kind of coverage pattern do you get? And so we found that 18 um, kind of gave us the best coverage pattern from an Omni antenna without giving us a big shadow behind it. We do have an eight inch one. There's also a bracket for horizontal. So if you're putting it on like a stoplight, you can hang it down. And that horizontal bracket has the ability to tilt and adjust the angle to articulate in the direction you're looking for. Um, going forward, this is a, a heat map, um, predictive heat map, kind of open space of what you'd see at a, a five meter height um, so five meter mount heights up to 100 meters, you're getting about a minus 51 signal strength near the edges. At 1,000 meters, you're about a minus 72. Um, so pretty strong, pretty decent. What, what was the coverage. client device you were listening on? Uh, this is a predictive model. So this wasn't oh. actually listened by a client device. Um, Chuck said he sent out some new data that's a little bit newer than what we're looking at here. Yeah, I have I think some. Ozer has. Well, let so me we'll take it. Take a second to put that up. Just take me a few minutes, yeah. Can I ask a general question in the meantime? It's Please. a general AC question. Um, obviously, a Wave 1 is quite a, kind of sold as 1.3 gig and everybody's doing that, that's, that's fair enough. But I'm interested in what's the real world uh, ability of using 80 megahertz channels. So obviously the biggest increase with Wave 1 comes from 80 megahertz channels. So sort of two questions there. Has Aruba seen in any of the, early, I realize it's early days, but the <coughs> early deployments uh, sort of two things using you pretty much need to use uni 2e to make it really worthwhile in most deployments I guess so the traditional issue there was of course le maybe legacy clients not supporting so have, have you seen issues there and uh, 
Secondarily, the dynamic, there's not much out there on it, but dynamic bandwidth operation. Uh, is that something that is supported? I think, I think it has to be supported. It is. So the first piece, or the second piece, part of the standard is dropping from 80 to 40 and 20 megahertz dynamically based on how you utilize the channels. Uh, we've seen that work very, very well uh, in deployments, and that's happening kind of per packet. So we've seen that work well. We do have deployments using that. And so that's how you can get away with having only four or five channels and working effectively. Um, so that does seem to be working. DFS, we've seen most of the devices these days are supporting it. Legacy devices, to your point, are still a problem. Really, healthcare is the only industry where we routinely see issues with it. Right. They have a lot of old IV pumps, a lot of old voice badges that really just have horrible radios in them. And they often have helicopters landing on the roof that bring in radar events. So right. those things kind of coming together. Healthcare is an industry where we haven't seen a lot of DFS. Okay. Um, but most enterprises and a lot of universities we're seeing are getting away with DFS and it's working well for them. I think the part that's forgotten as well, uh, you know, people talk about a coverage hole. If you're an under, an AP, under an AP that's on a DFS channel and the client doesn't support it, if you're using something that's restricted to 5 gig, then yes, you're going to have that coverage hole. But if you're not, they're still going to get coverage from the 2.4. So it's That's true. And they're going to see radios around it. Right, because not every AP is going to be on that DFS channel. They're yeah. going to be kind of so sprinkled yeah, around. Depending on your density, you may well not even have a significant yeah. issue. Um, and we've been seeing very strong coverage with our AP225 indoors, um, and we haven't really seen any issues with that at all. Um, so some of the data, um, I'll let Chuck talk through it if you'd like, since I think he did the testing out here on Crossman. <laughs> Um, yeah, and we skipped introductions. I know many of you, but uh, there's some new faces. So I'm Chuck Lukaszewski. I work in the CTO office, and I do a lot of outdoor uh, work. Um, so yeah, we spent a lot of uh, quality time in the field with uh, with this AP, so it's pretty exciting. Um, this data is uh, with uh, VHT uh, 80 uh, channels, right? So uh, full width and uh, full modulation. And to go to the question that you were asking earlier, you, you can see, so we're at 700 megabits. Uh, t this is TCP with the uh, chariot um, out to, you know, the, the fall off is within 25, 25 meters or so. So we do see some three stream rates and it is highly uh, geometry, it, it's highly environmentally sensitive, right? Uh, what's the reflective environment like uh, and so on. Um, uh, most of this data was taken uh, around here on a clean channel, so. <coughs> Uh, there, we are getting some bounce. If you went in the middle of nowhere and did a typical kind of outdoor, you know, uh, uh, manufacturer range test, we, you might not see this at short range. Um, and then, um, you know, you can see out to 400 meters, you know, we're, we're over 250 megabits uh, uh, per second, which is uh, pretty impressive, uh, frankly. And um, we've also run this with and without beam forming. So the dash lines, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the, the yellow line. The solid lines have transmit beam forming on, the dash lines have it turned off um, down along the bottom. Uh, so no, no, sorry, this is down and this is up. Uh, the dash are upstream. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, and then uh, the two colors are, the, 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 the red lines are beam forming on and the, uh, the other color is uh, explicit beam forming disabled. So, so we do see some benefit um, to it, but it's, um, uh, again, considering just the variability of the environment, um, it's it's situational. I've 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 done tests where I've seen up to a three to four dB sort of uh, pretty consistent gain in both directions if both ends are are beamforming capable. If one end is is capable, um, so the, the Galaxy S4. If we go to the next slide, actually. Um, so this data is to a Galaxy S4. Uh, and uh, this goes out to 90 meters, so a little shorter range. Uh, just because we we ran out of time, it's not the the, the client continues to connect, but I, we have a this particular test bed stops at 90 meters, so there's we have to go to another test bed that we can go longer range. But uh, you can actually see quite a difference in terms of the beamforming effect. So the the Galaxy device is participating in the AC beamforming process, right? It's responding to the sounding commands and so forth. Uh, even though it's a single stream device, right? So it's uh, so it's helping the AP to uh, to make uh, the beamforming decisions, uh, even though it's not beamforming on the return. Right? So pretty impressive numbers. What yeah. sort of distance then can you, you know, if you're only going to 90 meters, if you're putting, if you're doing an AP deployment on light poles or whatever it's on, what sort of distances? Obviously, it's going to depend on what data rate you want, but if we make assumptions of you know a couple of megabit 
or whatever you know even a, a, enough a high enough data rate that it's reliable right. what sort of distances do you think you can well so have? so typically we're, we're, we're if you think about a metro deployment, um, you're no more than 400 meters between nodes anyway. Um, to for precisely the reason you just you just identified, the the client's going to connect a lot further uh, than that. But um, you know, depending on the capabilities of the individual client, I mean, you can go, you, you can generally connect to over a kilometer, depending on the particular client. But the rate that you would get at that range is not that usable. So 400 meters apart, we're talking about a 200 meter radius, so if you're in the center, Precisely. essentially going to one or the other. Yes, exactly right. Um, and also, uh, this AP will be the one of the, f uh, the first one that we've ever shipped that really um, uh, will support the full EIRP in every regulatory domain. So um, I, I believe this will be the market leading. Yep. Uh, we, we will support higher, uh, basically you, you can go all the way to 36 dBm EIRP uh, if the regulatory domain allows it on that channel. Uh, so that's a pretty, pretty... What would you be uh, using that for, though? Because the client wouldn't be capable, right? Aren't you going to get... So that would be for bridging applications? Right. Okay. Okay, so point to point. Right. No, in the exact use case, you're just asking about how far apart can you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just a question on that uh, S4. Does it support the 80 megahertz channel? Yep. Yes. Um, most of the smartphones do. So the Samsung Galaxy S4, HTC One, Moto X, Moto Ultra. Note 3. Note 3. Well, it's mandatory to support 80 meg for AC. Every, right. Everything right. is AC. Yeah. And pretty much all those devices are AC, so they're a large number. You can't actually buy a new MacBook without getting 11 AC in it as well. And if um, it's AC capable, it will also have DFS. Right. As in it will... It, what do you mean specifically? Uh, so, so you, to, to use 80 meg channels, you pretty much have to ha have the uh, full range. So in the Android devices, for example, the DFS support is real spotty, except in the AC-capable DFS or Android devices, which all do the DFS channels. Right, okay. So the, those vendors, have, or at least Samsung maybe, or, or, or those vendors have realized there's no point in doing AC if you can only do three channels or whatever. Uh, that, or that's channels. my interpretation. Yeah, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so this is again, kind of comparing it to some of the other things you see out there, it is very similar in size to the uh, standard video cameras that you see out there, or even lights out on a light pole. So this should keep people who are afraid of Wi-Fi giving them headaches and causing problems from complaining because they shouldn't even realize there's an access point out there. there. Might be some customers who would like a, like the black dome. The Lexan dome. <laughs> yeah, part. like something like a little screen top, that, uh, an accessory you can make it look like a video camera. Yeah, we might take a look at that. <laughs> um, we also get a lot of feedback that it looks like a water filter uh, yeah. or an oil filter um, because of the kind of the can at the bottom. But then some of the other things on the bottom, it has a little Gore-Tex plug, um, which you may have missed. That becomes very important for pressure changes. Um, so the Gore-Tex will allow water vapor and air out, but it won't allow liquid water through. So we don't run into any atmospheric issues. And when you have rapid temperature changes, um, you don't run into any pressure differentials trying to suck water in to the unit, um, which is very, very important. And it's one of the new features on this AP. Um, now taking a look at the kind of board inside of it, and this is pretty much everything. So the CPUs, are, or sorry, the radios are actually directly connected to the board. It's not a daughter card. Um, part of the reason for that was heat dissipation. This has much better characteristics for us. Um, and cost comes in as well, which is nice. Uh, the power amplifiers are right here on the board. They're a little hard to see. They give off about nine watts of heat all on their own. Um, so they're a major generator of the heat. So they're actually connected to the copper heat sinks on the back um, that are directly touching the kind of enclosure to dissipate heat as quickly and rapidly as possible. Um, it isn't, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these are industrial designed uh, CPUs, memory, and everything else from a temperature point of view. So no heaters, and we've properly derated the outdoor. So 150 really is 150 degrees Celsius, no problem. Um, one of the other things that we've added is surge protection for the outdoor deployments. So if you have cable meters or antenna cables that are less than three meters in length, you no longer need surge lightning arresters or surge protectors. That's uh, just built into the AP, it'll just work. So that was another one of those pieces of just simplifying things, because connecting those, you had to make them air watertight, uh, a lot of extra pieces people didn't realize to order extra things to manage and deal with. Uh, those are the PUE circuits in the bottom, surge protection. And then if you actually look at the AP, 
It's literally just dropping that board in and then dropping the AC power module and putting a gasket around the outside. So this greatly simplified manufacturing. Um, if you take an AP175 apart, there are about five different boards that have to be connected. So when it comes time to actually push it down the assembly line, they're much more costly and take a lot longer to build. So I mean, that's another way that we were able to get the price down to 1995 without cutting important corners. And we were just optimize the design. Any questions on any of this? I'm guessing not. Um, that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover from a deployment point of view. With this having the external antenna options on it, do you guys foresee this becoming your stadium solution? Let's ask the stadium guy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because that was the first thing when I saw it, other than that it looks like an acorn, which is kind of cool, but I was like, would this you be would be a stadium, a stadium AP, or so, a good solution for deploying inside of a stadium if you hit, if you can, to Lee's point, have the articulation to be able to hit underneath a, a girder that's holding the stands. And, right. So, I mean, the primary point of the external antennas was so you could go with directional, right? You've got Omni in there if you need directional or if you want a panel antenna, uh, we need external options. Um, and so with that, just one thing to mention real quickly, um, we thought a lot about it. So you can actually route the cables through underneath so no one sees them, and then they can go out the back if you direct them out to the wall. Um, and they're also kind of a, a groove here so the cables can fit and slide out in either direction. Um, but in terms of the stadium design, I'll let Chuck answer, because Chuck does most of our stadium designs. Um, yeah, so it depends on the facility, um, right? So um, uh, it, uh, generally our stadium customers are very cost conscious, right? And the stadium, the, the total investment for a stadium goes beyond just the access points, right? So you're typically, there's a wired infrastructure and uh, so on that's going in. So um, uh, that generally means that uh, if you're in a stadium that is uh, in a temperate climate, we, we may actually be using indoor APs in some type of protective enclosure um, uh, if, if they're gonna be exposed. Uh, obviously, if the customer's budget will allow it, then this is a great alternative, right? So it's up to them. But uh, when we go to Canada or if we go, uh, we do a lot of deployments in the Middle East and Asia, of course, uh, as, a world, as a global company. And in those environments, um, then yeah, we would be going to the, to the 274s as kind of the, the, the lead option. And the, we're refreshing the entire antenna lineup. So, uh, and, and we're actually also simplifying it in a couple of uh, sort of key ways. Uh, so you'll have all the same choices that you've had before now, but we're going to get rid of the distinction between the indoor and outdoor antennas. So all the new, all the new antennas will be three element, uh, triple polarization, um, but they're, uh, we're, we're moving away from pigtails. So you'll just buy the cable you need based on the deployment type, right? Um, and that simplifies a lot of stuff because we never uh, it means that we have to have both indoor and outdoor versions of everything, right? And uh, that just is just confusing for our partners and for the field. And then the pigtail's never long enough, so you need to buy another cable anyway, and then that's got to be weatherproofed and so on. So it just simplifies the whole um, process. And hopefully that's one of the really key messages. Peter said it a couple of times. Um, we, we, we explicitly set out to dramatically reduce uh, not just the price of the product, but the installation and operational costs of the, the unit, uh, we, we think we, we, we would kind of the per pole installation cost, if you want to think of it that way, uh, may, be, may be decreased by a factor of two to three, d depending on the country. When you talk about stadium designs and you're talking about highly directional antennas, what are the concerns, especially when you talk about the output power of this particular AP being potentially so much uh, higher than others? Are there, are there regulatory concerns using highly directional antennas at an extremely high power output? Turn it down. But yeah. it, so, yeah. so, but the FCC, <laughs> so the FCC doesn't, is, you know, that's not, you know, when you talk about doing an FCC validated package, right, and I'm going to submit right. this AP with this antenna, the FCC collectively won't validate a package with the answer of, oh, turn yourself down in order to not exceed regulatory limitations, right? Right, so, so maybe, maybe just a quick recap in terms of how the um, Aruba system does uh, uh, compliance with with the power limits. So the whether you're on an instant or a controller-based solution, we are going to enforce the EIRP limits, taking into consideration the gain of the antenna that's connected, right? So the it doesn't matter which product you're running, it will, um, so you have an obligation. If you're using external antennas, you have to be a professional installer, and then you have an obligation when you when you install the unit to provision the antenna gains properly. 
the system will then take that into consideration based on what the channel and the country and so on is so that we will not exceed what the regulatory limit is. Um, so that's the right. But but be, that being said, you won't go over the regulatory limit, but you would never want to deploy at that high of a power in a stadium. Right. right? You're going to want micro cells. So you would be turning it down to get well, well, well below regulatory limits. Right, and I suppose I, you know I was wondering about the about the SEC conversation in particular, right? Because uh, it, it's easy to it's easy to go in and say, well, I've got a zero gain antenna, right? At which point you've clearly exceeded FCC. Right. Uh, limits in a unit like this. Right. So, yeah, right. So, what, in other words, Peter was saying is what's smart for the design is a separate issue from what's legal in the particular country. Right. right. Yeah, is no, it no. still the case? I know in the past that the FCC, like what you're saying, <coughs> like, had to be a package, the antenna and, and the AP. Is that still the case now? I yes. thought it had changed. No, it's changed. We, we're required to certify as a system. Right. Okay. So, so you do have to submit them together, collect in a pack in a, a AP and antenna. Yes. Yeah. But as a, but as a professional, we can swap out. So same we can we can we can break that package. Yeah. And so we, we, just we can't don't go have customers to do and then sell that as an FCC validated yeah. solution. It's just what the vendor's submitting to the FCC right. for testing. Right. right. Yeah. Um, so this is fully managed in AMP and all of that. And yep. It's supported in Airwave. Um, there'll be an instant version and a controller version. Um, as was mentioned earlier, it should be launching probably mid-February. Um, officially, it's going to be on our February price list in two days. So um, I think our public launch is mid-Feb. That's correct. And as, as Chuck was saying, I'm just going to reiterate, all the feedback we got on outdoor wireless is it's too hard. It's too hard to figure out how to mount. It's too hard to figure out the antennas that I need. It's too hard to figure out how to build the quote. Right? And this is everything where your sales team is literally saying, I don't know all the pieces that need to go in here, and you need an expert to do it. All that sort of stuff is what we were trying to clean up. Um, on the last slide, you had the, your lightning resistors. Um, the surge protection for outdoor? Yes. Is that from the antenna or is that from your Ethernet side? And is it replaceable or are you still replacing the entire AP Go ahead. at that point? Well, yeah, so, so, so no product is going to survive a direct strike, right? right? Um, uh, so this is for induced surges in the vicinity up to the limit of protection provided by the, by the circuit, right? Um, uh, and it is on the radio side. So uh, anytime, as has always been a best practice, if you're connecting a radio, an outdoor radio to an indoor system, uh, you're going to want to make sure that you have some type of protection at the building entry point, right, um, to, to shunt whatever surges uh, or currents uh, might happen uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, but that would be outside the system. I got two questions. One is around that um, two Ethernet ports are like the 225. Are these lag capable? Um, uh, I need to double check on that. Yeah, I'm not um, actually I'm not sure. sure the answer. That's okay. And then the other thing is. Honestly, I, I, well, I just want to, on that point, I don't think it's really necessary yeah. to lag two Ethernet ports with wave one. And I even think it'll be dubious with wave two. Yeah. Um, the, I was just curious from a lightning protection perspective you know do, are people going to put two runs out there and just in case and you know in case i lose you know n you never break cables outside so that was not so much for a uh, uh for a throughput perspective but from a resiliency outdoor perspective redundancy i don't expect many people to pull two ethernet cables just from a cost point of view um uh, uh, it, it's cheap i mean doing it. If, they're pulling one, then if you're pulling one you might as well pull two, pull two. <laughs> Because most of the, most of the cost is the labor, labor for the guy going to do it. Um, so that was my, my question. The uh, second question is, uh, you said it's a 36 dB uh, transmit cable. What's the bottom end? Like neg 10? Uh, so there's excellent power linearity. Uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's how, how low can you set the conducted power? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, zero dBm. Zero dBm, okay. Uh, plus, of course, any gain yeah. on your antenna. And, and this is true of the, the indoor, the, two, the 200 series? Uh, as well as the outdoor, uh, we, uh, you, you, if you set it to zero, one, two, three, you will get zero, one, two, three. Okay. What do you guys think? Is it okay? Awful? We shouldn't ship it. <laughs> I think what, what you said before about outdoor, when I've dealt with other outdoor APs, it's been a massive issue. Even for me, reading the doco. <laughs> like the complication of the antennas on different ports and there's so much complication involved to try and 
pass, even if I'm getting confused, trying to pass that onto the cabler or the, or the uh, rigger, you know, something gets lost and you've got the wrong antennas on the wrong ports. So right. I think this is, that's, for me, What's that's What's the key. external version look like? Anything uh, that needs a bucket truck still stays complicated. If you could figure out a way to mount it at six feet, but somehow get an antenna up here that does that, then you'd, then you'd really have it. Um, so a couple of questions real quick, I'm going to hop back. The external antenna version looks nearly the same. The bottom portion isn't quite there. So you get the top metal piece. Um, so you get a top metal piece, and this is kind of a, just a privacy shield. It's just to look better going over. Oh, okay. So if I, yeah. I go down one, the cables actually connect on connectors that are hanging at the bottom. So there's six connectors hanging at the bottom. Ends? Yep. Yeah. Um, and then there's just a... And your, eight, your antennas will also be in, then you'll just get cable pieces in between. If needed. That's the new style. You buy the, you buy the intermediate cable you want, and then the, the antennas will be uh, N females on the back. And so the cables are just generic, you buy... Yeah. And so there's two, two ports there? Six. Uh, six. Oh, so there's six antenna ports at the bottom, two Ethernet ports, USB, and then AC power. So okay. if you want to use it. If you're using this for like point to point, can you cap two of them and just go with the dual polarity for the uh, I mean sorry. does it have bridging built in or meshing that you could Um Yeah, so so there's there's <coughs> excuse me. Uh, uh, th there's still probably value in having again the antennas you're gonna buy will have three elements in them and um, uh, we don't have data on this yet. Uh, there's active debate about uh, for point-to-point -point shots, right? Um, how much uh, is, is there a rate versus range benefit? For example, for the oh, third for the chain, third one. even though we're not getting a third full polarization, uh, we, we we think the answer is yes, but I can't just I can't show you numbers. Uh, so in that case, you would hook up three, and then you'd cap the other. Uh, so for the radio you're using, and then you'd cap the other three. Is that yeah, did I understand? So that now question? they mesh. I mean, is is the bridging? built into the firmware just that that's a easy flip on it's a standard uh, mesh software mesh technology that we have and it's okay. in both the instant and the yeah, it comes with every single ap yeah. that we build actually it's part of the software what about uh grounding so a lot of outdoor units you have to have a ground lug so right here it's hard to see this little brass piece is your grounding um so there's just a, a hole there okay. the, the little piece wasn't included but that's how you would ground so you, uh, I'm assuming you are expected to ground this unit? Yes, yep. yes. that would be recommended.